so far we have gone through fly ash and when we have talked about fly ash uh, polymer composites, so fly ash in polypropylene, then biopolymerase PVA and now we can show the work done in making epoxy composites. Now, epoxy is a matrix for many lots of composites. Now, epoxy has one feature, it has very good bonding and it is a thermosetting agent, but epoxy also has other features that epoxy is relatively brittle, the matrix. So, if we put flash and epoxy, whether then you can develop a better matrix which can be used either as epoxy or it can be used as a refined or renovated matrix for making composites. Because carbon fiber reinforced composites or other composites, they have lot of good properties, very high strength, but their toughness needs to be kept on increasing as much as possible. This work shows development of coal power fly ash particulate reinforced epoxy composites. We know fly ash is cheap, lightweight, abundantly available waste materials. Technically, it is equal, equivalent to or superior to virgin material. And we have seen so far structural fields, flowable field, fly ash bricks, structural field, embankment road base. So, all these areas where fly ash is being used. Now, roofing tiles, paints, these are all areas where fly ash has been used and also fly ash is used. To answer your question, whether you ask, did you ask the question whether fly ash is used commercially? Yes. Yes, there are many patents and many areas of fly ash is being used in many of these areas in many different countries and approved by government. Now, polymer based composites, the most common polymer matrix composites are made of thermoset, which is epoxy that is used for structural composites. And this is the structure of epoxy. You have epoxy and you put a filler dam in, which actually initiates the joining of the epoxy rings. Epoxy is when you put it, it is like a monomer and then the curing agent combines the monomer and eventually it becomes a cured polymer. So, this is the mono, this is the epoxy and you add this curing agent and you give it time and also a temperature and eventually this becomes the epoxy compo epoxy matrix cured matrix now cure of, uh, curing of epoxy so it now becomes a very big molecule after the curing eventually it keeps on forming things like that so it becomes a very big molecule then people have studied the possibility of making epoxy fly ash composites and here it, it can be seen that this published work that modulus and relative packing volume as it goes up this is this is the modulus this is the rule of mixture which is this and this is the modified chemical equation. So, this is the one. You remember we followed all these equations in a in an earlier paper day before yesterday or maybe yesterday, yes yesterday. And then relative packing volume when you have the all this curing after the curing it goes about 
was 70 to 80 percent level and it remains relatively around that level, does not go much more higher than that. The work which we have done is to fabricate fly ash epoxy composites using as received fly ash and from 0 to 50 weight percent fly ash in epoxy and this is the normal epoxy. The fly ash particles were ball milled in this one because what happens then you get you get more surface area and when you cure because in the case of case of epoxy once you mix it within half an hour or so the material starts becoming rigid you do not have much more time. So, ball milling, ball milling has not been used very much, but our this work we have started because we have a one of our my colleagues is a ceramic engi ceramic engineer and we involved him and we did the ball milling of the flyers particles followed by fabrication of composite composites. So, first before putting the fly ash and epoxy, the fly ash particles were ball milled and subsequently the same fly ash particles in these weights they were put in epoxy matrix and the epoxy matrix becomes become a composite <laughs> all right. The characterization were done by Vickers micro hardness which shows the abrasion resistance, tensile testing which means strength to failure, strain to failure, modulus of velocity these are the standard and then microstructural analysis which shows the analysis of fracture surfaces to understand mechanisms of particle epoxy bonding as well as presence of any void or if you can if it can be mineral if it can be minimized. Except the analysis mineralogical changes before and after the ball milling of the fly ash. So, these are the things which were done. So, quickly going through this to the fly ash, fly ash sample this is again from one of the stations. It is type F, it has very low very low calcium calcium oxide so type F fly ash, it has high silica and in that is how it, it keeps on keeps on going ok. This is sulfur tracks and it goes silica, alumina are the highest quantity and not much or almost nothing calcium oxide. So, it is a totally class F and LOI carbon content is about 1 percent, 1 percent. The resin is DGPA, what does DGPA stand for? Diglycidyl ether of bisphenol A, all right. It is a normal epoxy resin, it was supplied by the Burns company, New South Wales, Australia. NSW is New South Wales, it is the name of the state where my university is. Properties of the epoxy resin used, it is clear color liquid, low viscosity and the viscosity is 500 to 1000 MPa dot second at 25 degrees C and the hardness viscosity is 100 to 300 MPa at 25 degrees C. It has low curing shrinkage if you cure it at room temperature. And this way, what the fabrication did, we these tensile tests were prepared and also tensile specimens were prepared by using this ASTM D six thirty eight and this is the Sharpie not specimen 
Now, this can also be used as a three dimensional loading if you want put a load like, like that. So, that is a different way, but it can be done and the width is 15 millimeter and the thickness of the samples are 4 millimeter. Length gauge length is 50 millimeter and gauge length plus extra length is 64 millimeter. So, these are the standards. So, cast and cure tensile samples of epoxy with let us say with 20 percent fly ash, these are done in a plastic mold. So, that you make cavities there, you have holes matching the specimens uh, size and depth and then you put the mixed epoxy with fly ash there and then you get the composites. Once you have the composites, then the testing and characterizations show how you can measure the properties of the fly ash. This is one feature which so far we have not discussed or normally most of the engineering places it is not applied, but this is known as Vikas micro hardness measurements. So, where you what you do it is a very small area and a diamond indentation goes in and when you remove the diamond indentation. So, there may be some elastic recovery, but this is what is the type of the type of the indentation and the size of the indentation. So, optical pictures here when you have 40 percent fly ash in the epoxy looks like this and the 50 percent fly ash it looks quite stem. The comparison of the graph, the Vegas micro hardness shows that different compositions actually shows different percentage. So, if you put this is PHR that means, if you are putting this shows that you have 100 grams total weight. So, if you have 100 percent flash or 100 PHR flies in the resin. So, that is things and this is lower value, this is lower value. So, if you now put the composition features. So, now this blue is the 0 fly ash, then light blue is the 10 percent fly ash, then the triangle is the 20 percent fly ash and it shows that there is no regular order and in fact, these two greens are here and there and it shows that if you are using the studying the fly ash using different load for the for the formation of the notch. So, these are the fly ash percentage and this is the load applied on the top of this diamond indenter. So, it gives different kinds of graph. So, that is one thing one has to be aware of, because if you are using like lower load you get high vehicle hardness and if you are using high load you are getting lower vehicle hardness. So, this is the kind of thing and if you are coming to much higher load 1 kilo then you are you get for these two you get much lower vehicle hardness, but it changes from 12 to about 18. So, this is something which was found interesting maybe if you are putting a higher load then there is more plastic deformation that could be some reason whereas, at these points of loads there is for a small elastic deformation. Tensile test No, 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 there is not, yeah, that is why there is hardly any difference in the indentation. Yes, the only thing is, is what this picture cannot give is what is the depth of the indentation, but the area surface top area is the similarly, but there are formulas 
which measures the this Baker's micro hardness. All right, it is a standard procedure, but not much used in the in the in engineering industry. But it's for calculation. Okay. Brin air, but Brinell hardness is a spherical spherical size. Yes, and you also can Baker's hardness. Baker's hardness is a diamond, but much higher load. But this is micro hardness. That means you use very low load. So, like you can start from 20 gram, and there is very limited work done in this area. So, this scholar actually, she used her name is Shahad Ibrahim. Uh, she, she is originally from I think from Iraq, so Middle East country, and she is a very good researcher. But she used all these different things, and then, and then it was found that under different load applied, the hardness shows different values. All right, so thousand gram is a big load for the epoxies, but if you go there, but it also shows that after about 500 grams, the it starts becoming quite more flattish type. So here, here is there is a sharp drop, but after the load becomes 500, it's much more flat. So perhaps it will be worthwhile using in future load in this range around. All right. The yield strength of the flash composites cured at 120 for two hours, average of five samples, showed that the maximum strength is achieved at 10 percent fly ash by weight. So, this is the yield strength. So, he says if you put more fly ash, this is zero fly ash, and this is about 10 percent fly ash, and then it shows that if you are putting more fly ash, then tendency is for it to come and then become that. So, it might in that case, the more flyers might act as a source of stress concentration. The strain to failure value of the epoxies are showing highest value for the neat epoxy and then rapidly reducing with flyers content. So, this is something surprisingly, it shows the maximum of the 40 percent, you have actually the strain to failure. Now, here strain to failure is 0.35 means it is 35 percent, is 0 0.05 means it is 5 percent, and then if you are going more, it is coming down to 2 to 3 percent. So, typically for brittle plastics, even if you get 5 to 10 percent, that is quite, quite accepted, okay? much better than the ceramics. Eventually, anyway, and is saying that eventually the strength showing a maxima at 40 flies content. So, there is a very good correlation between the strength and the ductility data in this network. So, if the strength also came down, if you go back to that 40 percent, the ductility and the, this is the yield strength. Okay this is the ductility. So, at 40 percent, the ductility is quite high, but if you go to the yield, st yield, st the yield strength, that is quite low. So, this material strength becomes low, but its ductility becomes, so that means it's, it, it becomes a soft material here. And so, if you go to the next slide, that because of the soft material is deformation goes up. So, it becomes more ductile. So, depending on what kind of things you want, if you are going to use it in a situation where it can under, it, it may be undergoing more ductility, then go for 40 percent thing. Otherwise, if you need a very high strength, but then go for the 10 percent, 10 percent thing. Okay? So, that kind of information it, it gives. Now, the 10 percent weight shows grown crack with two flash particles visible. You can see some of the flash particles, but the crack has grown. You can see flash particles here, flash, 
flies flies particles and also you can see flies particles there and the crack is going and in this situations these flies particles have not come out they are still bonded to the matrix whereas some other flies particles they are cracking and other some other as pull, pulled out so this is this is for 0 percent and then if you have 10 percent then you can see some of the particles are pulled out, these are the pulled out, these are pulled out. So, pulling out takes more energy. So, if you go back to that so with 10 percent, the yield strength goes up. So, that energy and strength is correlated to this pulling out. So, this is with 10 percent, this is this is 0 percent and this is this is the 10 percent the particles are pulled out. So, that is taking up the strength this is a growing crack. So, this material is strong, but its ductility is low later on as we have seen that is because the material the crack is can you see the crack is quite sharp this crack is quite sharp all right and here the scale bar is 20 micron. So, the crack is pretty sharp here. So, that can take less that can show less deformation. If we strain to failure with 10 percent is the deformation is much less whereas, with the 40 percent where the strength was much low the deformation goes up. So, this is these are the correlation. So, this shows that yes this is true in all from all different angles if now if you go to 20 percent fly ash individual fly ash particles in epoxies. So, this shows here I am just sitting down for a few things may, maybe my feet has got lot of fly ash particles in it and it is not deforming. All right. So, this is 30 percent fly ash this is sorry this is 20 percent fly ash and this is 30 percent fly ash, but debonding is happening with large particles rather than small particles. So, now you can see that debonding is there, but also the, the sharp crack has disappeared can you see that the sharpness of the crack is not there and again going back if you going back to the earlier one its strain to failure is much high. So, it is matching in the case of 10 percent the crack is very sharp in the case of 40 percent fly ash the there is not much of sharp cracks there. So, this shows micro macro correlation. Now, again when you go to the 40 percent the xenosphere F A fly ash particle xenosphere means which yeah. which has some void in it there is a hole in it. So, this is particle means this is a hollow particle, but it has been filled up with the resin it has some hollow hollow particle not all of them this is a solid particle, but this is a hollow particle which is filled up filled up with the resin. So, this is also another type of behavior. Then when you go to the 50 percent fly ash then fly ash particles are attached to the matrix some fly ash particles are pulled out that means it comes out and is on the other half of the fracture surface. So, this is the kind of feature which you, you can see again please note that all these scale bars are at the same level 20 micron 20 micron 20 micron 20 micron. So, kindly keep this in mind when you are comparing the, this SEMs or things please put them under the same level same scale level. Okay. Now, we are going to FTI data can you speak up? Yeah. 
not low temperature, low concentration. Low concentration, what happens? You have lesser particles. So when the crack is progressing, so if I'm going along it, and if there is something in front of me, I have to stop. So if I'm a crack, and as this time crack is going, but then there is another particle, big sphere in front of me. So either I have to go along with that, or I have to crack it again. So that is what happens if you have lesser number of particles, chance of crack growing is sharp more. But if you have more number of particles the larger, then crack gets stopped. And every time it stops, you have to start. And crack starting energy is always more than the brittle energy. So the more stopping you can do, so the, that is a very good question. If you can induce a lot of stopping, cracks may initiate, but if you can induce a lot of stopping, then it will have to, it will take more energy. Yes, 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 yes. Except for the fact that dislocations are much atomic, atomic version, and these are so the laws go a bit, a bit more at, in the atomic level. But here, is, these are this reaches the fracture mechanics level, brittle fracture mechanics. But that is true in the in the 10 percent one, you saw the sharp crack. But as the more and more things, the cracks get blunted. Because maybe it's growing, growing, but it's stopping, and once it stops, it starts again, and again goes and stops, and it takes some more energy. Okay? Thank you for your question. Now, th this is the FTI data for fly ash, epoxy, and fly, fly ash, epoxy, and the fly ash epoxy composites. Okay, so this is for fly ash. This is for a pure epoxy. Now, can you make some comments on you, FTR expert? What do you see in the flyers epoxy composites? Can you see extra pigs? Both pigs are there. So, does it mean there is any bonding or debonding or no? Yeah, but are there any extra peaks? Huh? Can I see any extra peaks? Which one? If you go back to this one, fly ash has only one one peak. Okay. Okay, so I ask your question, and this is what we understand from here. FTR for both composites does not show any peak at 9, 15. So this this one is 20 percent composite, 20 percent flash composite, and this is 40 percent flash composite. But here, both peaks do not show any 915 centimeter inverse peak which indicates that addition of flyers does not obstruct the cross linking of the DGBA. Is it agreeable by chemists? Hmm? What? This, this is FTIR, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. So 915 peak is somewhere, somewhere here, around here. That is the large peak. That is for the epoxy. And in the flash composites, for both composites, that 915, that peak does not show, it shows small thing, but does not show that, that kind of up and down peak. But as I said, I am not an expert on fly ash, not, no, not the FTIR, but 
we have experts here. And you also think there is, does it show any evidence of bonding between fly ash and epoxy? Any new peak? No. Not showing any new peak. All right. Now, the same behavior is observed at 3056. So, about here. If you go back to the previous one, 3056. This is that 3000. This is it goes 3058, 3036. So, it shows that the there is no peak at 915 in both of the things, and the same behavior is observed at 3056. That means if you go there, you don't see any peak. It's a flat thing. If the peak circum peaks means when it comes goes up and down. So this is flat. This is a peak. This is a peak where it looks, looks like a end of a triangle, but this is going flat. So so the peaks is where actually infrared get absorbed and that relates to the structure and of the, and the particulate aspects of those atomic or molecular things. So the second thing is the 1732 centimeter inverse in both composites belongs to carboxyl group. 1032, where is 1032? 1032 may be somewhere here this one, this one, and that relates to the carboxyl group. And that carboxyl group, what is 1032? It will be somewhere here, 1032. All right. This 915 peak is actually the one in the top, not that at the bottom. It comes from the top to the bottom. All right. So, this is what Shahad Ibrahim, who is a, who had a very good chemistry background. Plus, we also worked with the chief of the FTIS section. So, when I don't understand, but it is, we go to the specialist, and the specialist give, give this, give this thing. Okay. So I'm not an FTIS specialist, so I cannot say any more than that. But this is, this is certified by Professor Graini Moran. I remember mentioned to you. She is the head of the Markano Wainwright Analytical Center, and she is also a very good analytical chemist. So that's what our interpretation is, and that we have to accept because we, if we do the thing, it gives additional information. But if I'm not an expert in that, it's better to go to experts and take their views. All right. So this is what. So this one seven three two. Centimeter in both composites belong to the carboxyl group, and the impurities present in fly ash react with the secondary alcohol present in the epoxy and form carboxyl groups. That's what is that you will say that how did carboxyl group come up, and it is believed that the impurities in fly ash react with the secondary alcohol, and the second new peak for both composites observed at 1653 centimeter. Then it represents OH bending. In the composite. So, where is 1653? This is the 1653. That is the peak. Now it's coming down like that. And here also you have 1653. And that peak perhaps did not exist in the exist in the case of here. This is one. 743, but it does not say how much this one is. But what is said that it provides an idea of increasing moisture content in both composites, presumably indicating epoxy as the source of the moisture. So if you have a bit more moisture, it will come up. Okay, so basically, now it has come to the end. What it says, we'll go to another lecture tomorrow where we actually look at the analysis of the SIMS and EDS. You are familiar with SIMS and EDS? You are fa huh? No, SIMS. We'll come to, you know EDS? 
no, energy dispersive spectroscopy. So that is normally normally is believed to be very good, but then we found SIMS is another technique which has come out and it shows SIMS is much better. So that's a new technology. So we'll go to that in tomorrow's lecture. So thank you everyone. Anytime you have a question, attack me as much as you can. And my aim is as a team I'll get back to you. Our team will get back. Okay? Never say no to anything. And never say you I know everything. No, I don't know everything. But that's the whole idea. We need to learn more. The science and engineering is so vast that we have all different facilities and things. You have material science here, here ITK, you have electronic engineering there, the other thing. But in my university, what I do, I send my students to every place. And then they do work for example, dielectric constant. We have done it in our some equipment, that equipment got lost on each and the thing. Then I send my student to professor of electrical engineering. He's from, he's a Scotsman. He came from University of Leeds. And then he did all the thing. And I don't understand much of this technology, but we still need because to get the things, when you get the results, then the, the results tell us and also that, that if you have different flash content, some of them give you very, the best positive dielectric constant, real dielectric constant, and some gives you the largest negative dielectric constant. So those things, then they explain, okay? But we have to combine all these things together. That's what science and achievement is. So I'm grateful to every one of you. Because I learned, and if I have not understand anything, I'll go back and talk to the respective professors and I have to learn, all right? Then we can do more research. Okay. This tutorial, I've been asked to give five tutorials, the second tutorial, the first one we had, and these tutorials are PDF slides, and I thought we have talked about polymers, plastics, and ceramics and everything. We have spent a fair amount of time on the contents of fly ash, which is ceramics and other things, but polymers also have their own features. So I thought I'll have at least one tutorial slide which is going through different kinds of plastics and their chemical natures and things like that, okay? If any of you think you know all, of, all about it, close your eyes and have a good sleep. Otherwise, you can ask me questions. Commodity plastics. And today, this will be the last lecture for me today. Hang on. Come on, where is that coming after that? How do I go to the second slide? Commodity plastics means plastics which are you using for various applications. Is it? Oh, okay, so I have to push this. Okay, thank you. See, I'm an idiot, isn't it? You people are, you people, no, thank you. You people are so clever. need a one minute break changing from the other thing so let me, let me change for you yeah, no no you change it to 100 percent so let's sing another song okay because that will bring something krishna kanhaya meru man tere or dhayu mere prabhu ji kab tum mere paas aayo aayo कब तुम मेरे पास आयो वृंदावन में गावत भक्तन तेरे गीत कैसे तुझे मैं पाऊं ओ मेरे मीत दो मुझे प्यार तेरे प्रीतम जहां भी जाओ कृष्णा कन्हैया 
मेरो मन तेरे ओर धायो चमकी चमकी उठे बी जरी चमकी चमकी उठे बी जरी जमुना की जलता आवे और रोशनी तेरे आँख प्रति फलता जल गया मेरे दिल कहे मुझे ऐसे जलायो खो गया मेरे जी कहे मुझे ऐसे सतायो कृष्ण कन्हैया कृष्ण कन्हैया कृष्ण कन्हैया मेरु मन तेरे ओर धायो मेरे प्रभु जी कब तुम मेरे पास आयो आयो कब तुम मेरे पास आयो कृष्ण कन्हैया कृष्ण कन्हैया ठीक है तो ऐसे कैन यू रीड इट फ्रॉम द बैक ओके थैंक यू ऑल राइट प्लीज गो हेल्प थैंक यू फॉर योर हेल्प नाउ वी डिड टॉक अबाउट ऑल एथिलिन इन वन ऑफ द लेटर एंड आई सेड आई एम कमिंग बैक टू Trias polyethylene later on, so it's good to go through some fundamental aspects of how polymers are and what they do. The monomer is the first thing which is prepared. At one time, ethylene for polymerization was obtained largely from molasses, a byproduct of the sugar industry. Molasses, is, you 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 know that. It's a sweet, and from molasses, one can get ethyl alcohol, and this may be dehydrated to yield ethylene, and then ethylene can be polymerized to polyethylene. However, today the bulk of ethylene, today the bulk of ethylene, is obtained. Ah, today the bulk of ethylene is obtained for polymerization. from petroleum resources petroleum sources so petroleum is another thing which is there in plenty at the moment and petroleum also causes a lot of heat problems when i come here it's so good to see people so many people walking in their iit kanpur and things like that everywhere okay throughout india that's what i like to see but when i'm there I don't see any people walking in the street. Maybe once, once in ten minutes or fifteen minutes. I think it's a wastage of energy and petroleum. But I cannot say much. I can take walk. All right. When supplies of natural or petroleum gas are available, the monomer is produced in high yield by high temperature cracking of ethane and propane. at one time as we have gone through okay good yields of ethylene may also be obtained if the gasoline fraction from primary distillation is cracked so let's not worry too much about all this the in the polymerization reaction the heat of polymerization must be once you have the monomers you have to make it polymer that means you have to heat them the monomer becomes long 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 so and particularly since decomposition reactions can take place at elevated temperatures so you have to polymerize it instead of the monomerization and there are impurities and if there are impurities these impurities can affect both the polymerization reaction and the finished product particularly electrical insulation properties and resistance to heat aging so the impurities must be 
rigorously removed. In particular, carbon monoxide, acetylene, octane, and moisture must be at very low level. A number of patents require that carbon monoxide content should be less than 0.02 percent. So these are the things which are required for manufacturing the polymers. You can use different techniques for making high polymers of ethylene like polyethylene. Now while I was there, I, I, was, I had a one, one of you asking the other one, how many polyethylenes you know? So I, I could hear the answer, so he said three types of polyethylene, is it right? And medium density. Oh, that's also a linear and low density polyethylene. That means there are four. High density, low density, medium density, and LLDP, linear low density. So they, you make it linear low density became a very big issue about 25, 30 years ago. Things like that, okay? ICI came up with it, and we are given some samples to work on. And we could really find that LLDP, linear low density polyethylene. That is, that is a very good thing. So these are the different methods, high pressure, Ziegler, the Philip processes. So, and the standard oil, Indiana process. Sometimes when I read the word Indiana, I close my eyes to get rid of the last A, so that I wish it's an Indian process, all right? But hopefully it will be done. Now, see the how did they come up with the name Indiana? Did it come because there are a lot of Indians in, in that set? Okay. Okay, high pressure polymerization. Commercial high polymers are generally produced under conditions of high pressure. So this is worthwhile knowing. And they at temperatures between 80 to 300 degrees C. So you have the monomers and they are under high pressure and high temperature. High temperature gives more reactivity and high pressure means the monomers cannot fly away from each other. Under pressure, you have to be all together. So that's why large molecular weight. Okay? Now change means? Yeah, yeah, take it, take it. Thank you. And then a free radical initiator such as benzoyl peroxide. So these are the ways how first monomer to polymer is made. And then it can be done in autoclave and also a high cooling surface volume ratio. These things can happen and in addition by running water. So this is the fundamentals of making the polymer yield. Now, having said that, typical monomer conversation to polymer is 10 to 30 percent, which is 0.1 to 0.3. Why I thought it is worth going through this? When we use polymers or plastics, we think they are very easy to get anyway. No, they are not very easy to get, get also. Polymers and plastics, people actually have to do a lot of work. So there is a lot of technique and technology, and there is also a lot of market in there. All right, so it can. I thought it's worth bringing this as a tutorial. So the conversion is typically 10 to 30 percent of monomer to convert. So let's say about 20 percent. After the polymer gas separation, am I standing in front of you? Can I, all right. After the polymer gas separation, the polymer is extruded into a ribbon and then granulated. So this, this granules injection molding and or compression molding. So how these granules you get? You just go and buy it from a company they give, but there is huge amount of work between these granules and there is a lot of energy absorption and things like that. So it's worth knowing that. To break up high molecular weight species present from film grades, granules are subjected to a homogenizing process 
in an internal mixer or a continuous compounding machine. So, these things happen, speed of reaction let us not worry about, density of polyethylene from high pressure. Now, is polyethylene lighter than water or heavier than water? How many of you think lighter than water? And medium density polyethylene? Okay, I will give you the values. Low density polyethylene density is 0.92 grams per cc. Medium density polyethylene is about 0.94 grams per cc. And high density polyethylene is about 0.96 grams per cc. So, you are correct, but it does not exceed that. So, that is one advantage of polyethylene. If you put it in water, eventually it flow, floats up, all right. Density range obtained, typically this is a like 0.92 to 9.4, so this is low density to medium density and high density is about 0.96 gram per centimeter cube. Ziegler process under low pressure is, in Ziegler process ethylene fed under low pressure into a reactor contains high as car hydrocarbons and reaction temperature is below. So, let us not worry about that, but important thing is here the production is medium density which is typically 0.94 grams per centimeter cube. The low density is between 0.191 to 0.94 and it is about the same 0.94. Now, low density polyethylene is much more ductile than medium density or high density polyethylene. That is worth knowing it. So, high density and if you are doing impact fracture test, as a low density polyethylene is very difficult to fracture. Whereas, high density polyethylene can fracture under this notch impact test. So, now you are there, if you do not need many high strength and but you need a lot more ductility and if you are thinking of putting fly ash there, you can consider using low density polyethylene. At the same time, if you are want to go to high density polyethylene, high density polyethylene at higher crystallinity, about 80 percent crystallinity, whereas low density polyethylene is about 50 percent crystallinity. So, that gives you other advantages. So, if you look at polyethylene, it has different grade and linear low density polyethylene is a new material over the past 20, 25 years or so and it has combination of high density polyethylene and low, low density polyethylene. Linear low density, you can write down the name. Okay, I will just write down the abbreviations. HDPE, high density polyethylene, MDP, medium density polyethylene, L. DPE, low density and then you have the new product and that is LLDP. This is linear low density polyethylene, which means it is much more linear rather than branch type of thing. The polymers can have kind of linear and branch structure. So, linear structure is much easier to handle. Okay. So, yes, the, because of the branching is reduced, it is reduced, but if you can reduce the branching, then perhaps you can in better improve the, this mixing and the things like that. And they have when they made LLDP, they actually made LLDP sheets and it was strong in one direction. So, yeah, that, that is the kind of thing. I think it was made by, was, was it ICI or at some other company, but it, it in Melbourne that time, 
company. It came there and you know one thing whenever in Australia, Melbourne particularly when I was there, any new product came from in the polymer, somehow or other they sent those to me. So, I was very happy, but I had to do a lot more work, but all LLDP and any other thing new epoxies and things like that. I don't know how they picked up my name. Bondabadde is not an easy name for them to remember, all right? But likewise, when I used to work in the Defense Science and Technology Organization, whenever they had problems with their components in ship war and things like that, they were to send to our DSTO. And some of that, the senior principal research scientist, he knew as my name. He said, let that guy work more and more. I said, you can give me work. I don't mind at all. But, but then I said, anytime I go, I will mention you as my leader so that they will send more work to you. I said, okay. So that was a very good fun. And once, I don't know whether I should say these things, but it's, it, it can help all of you. Once DSTO head office realized that CSI or equivalent to CSI here, CSI has much more, much more good name in Australia than DSTO. So they are looking for someone to work. So they asked all directors, all, all labs under DSTO. So somehow the IOS picked up and sent to Canberra for three months and I provided a solution. So that was nice. They, they gave me, they are there, give me a quarter thing. And being in the defense headquarters, and I was still not an Indian, uh, Australian citizen. I didn't want to be. But that gave me wonderful, wonderful thing in the, in the world. But eventually, what I suggested, they actually followed that. And the uh, image of DSTO became as I had the image of CSIRO. And then Don Pinkerton, the senior principal of societies, he gave me a nickname. And he said, we'll not call you bad dog. We'll call you the science seller. So you keep on selling science everywhere. So I said, yes, but I don't get the money. So but let the SEO get the money. OK? But that's the same thing. When I work, I don't want work for me. I would love all of you to get new things, get your money. And in the analysis, I don't need any money. All right? But please. Make sure to use all this information one way or the other and get more money to your university, to your states, to yourself, and to India. And if you come to Australia, also share, give part of the money to Australia. Okay. There is another process, let's not go into that. Okay. One thing is we need to know melt flow index. Okay. As I said, going back to the high density polyethylene, Mr. Pavatosh, I mentioned the density high density is 0.96. So this is where it comes. Okay, so it's a high density polyethylene. So it doesn't go over the density of water. Alright? So high density, highest density is 0.96. Melt flow index, what it means that how much it can flow under a certain pressure in about 10 minutes. The higher the melt flow index is, the more liquid the polymer. The lower the melt flow index is, the higher, higher is the problem of movement. Okay? So if you want to make something, if you are going to make composites using something like that, it is better to go for medium flow index or low flow or high flow index not low flow index low flow index means it may have very long things so it will not move around within that time so the mixing will not be like that so please make a, please make a note for making composites using polyethylene use low melt flow index material and as i said melt flow index is an inverse measure of the molecular weight so if the molecular weight is very high, then melt flow index is very low. Rigid, yes. And on the other hand, if the melt flow index is, sorry, molecular weight is very low, that when molecules are very short, then the melt flow index, because they can move very easily. 
Okay, and that is that is important because if you have to select a polyethylene for using composites using this kind of thing, injection machine and things like that, don't go for a high 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 molecular weight material. Go for low molecular weight material or medium molecular weight material. This is another method, let us not worry about it. Again, density of polyethylene about 0 0.96. Okay, now, as one of your friend reminded, and how quick, as soon as she said that, that, that went like a slide on the board. Thank you very much. Linear low density polyethylene, all right? This is, over the years, many methods have developed in order to produce polyethylene with short chain branch, but no long branches. So, not long branches and union carbide, yes, that is the one. Union carbide developed a gas phase process and thereby they use catalyst and this is known as linear low density polyethylene. This has a very good, this has a very good property and is precious typically it can, you can use it under 7.7 to 1, 2.1 MP at 100 degrees C of it. So, linear low density polyethylene is a very attractive material. Okay, LLDP density are now available in a range of densities from around 0.9, so very low density polyethylene to about 0.93 for ethylene acetylene. So, earlier the polyethylene, low density polyethylene was used to be about 0.915 or 0.92 like that but this one becomes even slightly lesser density. Now, you might ask the question, what is the difference between 0 0.90 and 0.915? There is, there is because not only density, the chain structure is such that it is a mostly linear. So, if you are trying to make injection molded things and it lasts very long, it takes much less time okay? and it does not undergo corrosion, it does not undergo breakdown. In the recent market, in the recent years, market for LLDP has increased substantially and it is now more than half the total of LDP and for HDP. So, this is a very good development. I will quickly go through structure property relationship of polyethylene. Polyethylene, this is the chain, chain branches, long chain aliphatic hydrocarbon. What is the difference between aliphatic and aromatic? So, aromatic comes up like that. So, starts from the starts from the roof and keeps on going coming down to the floor. Well, aliphatic, if it starts along the roof, it will go along the roof. So, it'll, so make sure if you are living in this hotel or any hostel, let not the polyethylene elephant, don't put any aliphatic polyethylene, can, it, uh, it can go from one end of the building to the other end of the building through the roof and you can see all of you what you are doing. Okay? But if it is an anomatic, it will settle down the rooms and it cannot move. So, that is a funny way, but that is how, that means aliphatic polyethylene can keep on moving and it is very easy to work on it. Aromatic means it is a change structure and you have to keep on pushing and things like that. But they are two times. And this is a thermoplastic. This material is a thermoplastic material. Why? Because there, there is no oxygen in it, in it, and so there is no carbon double bond oxygen and things like that, which often exist in the thermoset. So this is a thermoplastic. What does a thermoplastic material mean? Okay, okay. Uh, from all these things, the final thing has come. You can mold it, you can remold it. Now, that means you can remelt it, again remold it, provided it is not getting oxidized. So, it's, you can melt it, remelt it, remold it. So, it is, so if it is a waste material, you can remold it and it is not a, you do not have to throw it away. Whereas, epoxy and other things, once it solidifies, then you cannot, you cannot, 
but you can break it down and you can use it like a powder powder things but you cannot use it like the like the all right okay thermoplastic tg what does tg means okay so tg is glass condition temperature what does it mean above that is it it is glass above above that it has become soft so that then you can you can deform it you can mold it or bend it and below that it becomes like a glass hard very hard okay now it is worth noting and i would request all of you to remember this aspect the tg of polyethylene these are the references so it is it is very difficult to know which one it is but my supervisor who was an expert and who came and i i had a lot of trust in him and he told me the tg of polyethylene is typically he said band of whatever other people say take it typically about minus 120 degrees c so which means even if you are even if you are in the this uh, olympics winter olympic then you could take still take polyethylene and it would bend so some of you they say you are running on all those uh, food what is what are those things called you are just huh you, you know you are going on the on the snow yes boat sledges sledges okay so if you if you use low density polyethylene and if it is minus 130 tg then even if you are from the top if you are jumping it's not a glassy material if the temperature there is minus 20 degree so and if it is minus 30 is it will still bend but if the temperature on the on the of the ice becomes minus 150 minus this is minus 130 sorry even if it's minus 50 or minus 60 it's still all right this will always bend so that's where those materials are very useful okay because if you are going to use epoxy or any other stronger material it, it their tg is much higher normal tg epoxy may tg may be about 25 30 50 and some epoxy tg is about 120 c so this is you can use these materials in all this cold environment and also it means that wherever you are using it it will not crack under any temperature under any local temperature so that is the big advantage of linear low density polyethylene if you are going there and some people have even reported that tg of polyethylene is about plus 60 degrees c now they are not actually polymer experts they and they see they have if you go to 60 degrees c they see that the polymer bends sometimes if it bends then they call it glass condition temperature so don't call it you might call it a bending temperature it's not glass condition temperature. that's why when we have put put in this one a put a what is this surprise so how can people say that but as i said i still take the words of my supervisor bando tg of polyethylene is minus 120 and i trust him but even if you go for minus 105 onwards but it gives you an information that poly- polyethylene can deform well under normal temperature tg and tm of polyethylene some people say this minus 20 but as i said my supervisor said no but anyway and they also applied another transition to about 100 minus 120 okay before minus 20 was the most likely value for tg some people said and then he said such a value have as little technological significance because that, that means it says that don't go for this published value so 
if you are going to for Tm is the melting point, the range of melting point for polyethylenes is about goes from 108 to 132. So, if you are going for low density polyethylene, you have to be careful if the temperature goes to hot boiling water or 100 degrees C, it will be very close to being soft, close to melting. So, if you are going to use it anywhere in the hot, air, hot water situation, do not use low density polyethylene. But if you go to high density polyethylene, if you go to high density polyethylene, it's about 132. So this, is, so that is quite expected, and that is quite particularly because water has. What is the boiling boiling point of water? 100 degrees C. All right. So it's at least 32 degree above that. So it will not be able to. Hot water will not be able to melt high density polyethylene. Crystallinity is something which is very interesting. Amorphous density of polyethylene, if you can make it non-crystalline, then it amorphous density of 0.84 and crystalline density of polyethylene depends on what is the molecular distribution and things like that, but it is typically about 1.014 or maybe just close to 1, 1 gram per centimeter cube. So, that is quite a nice standard practice. Again, crystallinity is happens because how the molecular packing is there, those molecular packing, the high crystallinity also leads to opaque structure. So, when, what means if you go for low, low weight poly, it is an LDP which has lower crystallinity, it is much more transparent. But if you go to high density polyethylene, which has about one, it is not trans it's not transparent, it is opaque. So depending on if you want to put polyethylene sheets on your windows, and if you, you would like to see outside what people are doing, or if you want other, others to see what you are doing inside, you can put low density polyethylene, so that you can see yourself, all right, and they can see you. But if you, so that is advantage and disadvantage. LDP is or polyethylene is very cheap, much cheaper than other things, but and it is also quite a standard material, okay, and it does not melt, it, it does not absorb moisture and things like that. So, if you want to use high density polyethylene, then it will still give you some diffuse light, but it will still be dark, I mean not much of thing. If you have 5 millimeter thick, light will not come in. Whereas low density polyethylene we have like that. Solubility parameter, that is something also important. The polymer has a low cohesive energy density and would be expected to be resistant to solvents or solvents of solubility parameter greater than that. Because it is a crystalline material and does not enter into specific interaction, there is no solvent at room temperature. So polyethylene is very solvent resistance. So, that is something which is, is useful. So, if you put fly ash in polyethylene, you are using it in some areas where there can be acidic or, or acidic or alkaline something like that, but polyethylene will prevent any, any corrosion. All right? So, polyethylene has, has a very good property. At elevated temperature, the thermodynamics are more favorable to solution and the polymer dissolves in a number of hydrocarbons of similar solubility parameters. I will go for another three or four slides and we will call it a day and we will continue tomorrow. All right? Are you coming tomorrow? Tomorrow is holy. You are being bringing charana. High insulation. This is this is very. That's why I say I said that we'd go for a couple of more slides. The polymer, in the absence of impurities, would be expected to be a excellent high frequency insulator because of its nonpolar nature. And the fact is in accord with prediction. 
the pre this is the prediction and this is the fact and it is available many hundred hundred available many hundreds of grades of polyethylene most of which differ in their properties in one way or other so it's non polar nature and it does not it does not conduct electricity so it's very safe from that point of view variation in structural parameter you can have short chain branching you have long long short chain branching long chain branching variation in the average molecular weight variation in the molecular weight distribution the presence of a small amount of co co monomer there so these are the features which can have presence of impurities or polymerization residues some of which may be combined with the polymer so all these things can affect and eventually the material can actually has has branching also possibility of branching in high pressure polyethylene were first expressed when investigation using infrared spectroscopy see this is where infrared spectroscopy can tell you stories which other things cannot all right infrared spectroscopy is very good expressed when investigation using infrared spectroscopy indicated that there were about 20 to 30 methyl groups per 1000 atoms therefore in a polymer molecular about molecular weight about 26000 there would be about 40 to 60 methyl groups which is of course far in excess of one or two methyl groups to be expected in the normal chain ends so that is kind of things what can happen with polyethylene and more refined studies have indicated that the methyl groups are probably part of ethyl and butyl groups so let's stop here continue with this tomorrow i have to give two tutorials and two tutorials and two lectures so i have so far covered 11 lectures and i have to in total i have to give 25 lectures so another two tomorrow another two on friday and i'll continue with this this one tomorrow finish it up and i'll give another one to two. so i have 15 lectures and five tutorials so so far i've given 11 lectures and one and a half tutorials you can actually have Side chains per thousand carbon atoms in the Ziegler polymers. The branched high-pressure polymers have the lowest density, so that means the low-density polyethylene has the highest branched high-pressure polymers, and it has a lower melting point, lower yield point, lower surface hardness, and lower modulus of elasticity and tension. so the lowest get poly polyethylene has these properties lower melting point okay what is it what is the if you remember the, what is the expected melting point of low density polyethylene hundred yes hundred thirty to becomes for high 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 density so high so that's why i said 108 to 110 all right okay thank you like that so all these things are low yang's modulus in tension this property may dependent upon the so they have all this low but the best thing is it is very high when you are working it it is elongability okay so and flowability is much high in addition the more the branching the lower the crystallinity the typical low density polyethylene may have crystallinity of 50% and high density polyethylene will have crystallinity about 80% all right high density polyethylene and as i said you can make theoretically and some polyethylene which is 100% amorphous and that melting temperature becomes about 84 degrees <coughs> c but that's more a theoretical thing the greater more the branching and the lower the crystallinity the greater will be the permeability to gases and vapors because there is a lot more space or voids in the structure for general technological purposes 
the density of polyethylene as prepared from the melt under standard condition is taken as a measure of short chain branching. And this is an example of some branches. You have growing radical, dead polymer, dead polymer radical and then growing radical. So, this is how the long chain branches keep on going. Long chain branching and viscosity. One further effect of long chain branching is on flow properties. So, this is what is like well, viscosity is related to flow properties and flow properties is related to melt flow index. So, if flow pro melt flow index is high, the flow property is higher. So, if you are going to make composites using load, uh, polyethylene, it is better to select some materials which have at least good to high melt flow index. All right? Uh, then it will be mixing. If you have unbranched polymers, they have higher melt viscosities than long branch polymers with average molecular waves. So, this would be expected since the long branch molecules would be more compact and expected to entangle less with other molecules. So, these are the things. And now that we have talked about LLDP and LLDP is, is a very special plastic which represents about 50 percent of LDP and 50 percent of HDP earlier used. That means, use of LDP and HDP have come down by 50 percent since LLDP came. And LLDP can cover LDP and HDP. I still remember, I mean in my office, when I left defense and went to the I did not throw out those LLDP samples in some boxes. I still have those LLDP samples and those tensile test training results and things. You cannot throw them away, isn't it? Yes. Now, LLDP contains short side chains as a result of copolymerizing ethylene and with a smaller amount of higher alkaline such as oct 1 in, I do not understand those <laughs> meanings. Now, the word linear in this case is used to imply the absence of long chain branches. That is something what is necessary. There is no long, long chain branches. Co-monomers in polyethylene, you have hydrocarbons, hydrocarbons such as propylene, non-hydrocarbons like vinyl acetate. So, these are the co-monomers in polyethylene. So, all these things are there. There are also impurities. The final variable to be mentioned here is the presence of impurities. These impurities may have metallic fragments residual from the processes, Ziegler type processes that can be traced. And such impurities as catalyst fragments and carbonyl groups incorporated into the chain can have a serious adverse influence on the power factor of the polymer. So, these things can have, what is the power factor of the polymer? Who can tell me power factor, what is the power factor of polymer? Who is the electrical expert here? What is the power factor? So, impedance is Okay. Can you stand up and tell everyone what power factor is? Connective resistance and reactance together known as And how is power factor related? Cos phi is equal to R by Z. So, R is taken as resistance and Z is impedance. Okay. Thank you. All right. And also, In some cases, the impurities can have an effect on the aging behavior. That means, it might react, so it might lose its permanent properties. So, quickly polyethylene, properties of polyethylene, it is a works like thermoset, oh, sorry, thermoplastic, softening at temperatures between 80 to 130 C, density less than that of water. Will you, everyone remember, density less than water, tough, but has moderate tensile strength excellent electric insulator. 
it has excellent electric insulator, very good chemical resistance. So, polyethylene actually is a very ideal polymer. In the mass, it is translucent or opaque, but thin films can be transparent. So, if you want to make thin films of polyethylene from even body or bio, biopolymer types of things, it will be transparent. All right. Mechanical properties very much dependent on the molecular weight and on the degree of branching of the polymer, also depending on the rate of testing, how fast you are going to test. The, I think I had mentioned to you not only for speed of testing has a great influence on the ductility or brittleness. I may have mentioned yesterday or day before, but I will still repeat it once again. When I was to work in defense, polymethyl methacrylate, which is perspex, which is considered as a brittle material, but then I ran an experiment which went for 7 days in the instrument at the lowest speed available in the instrument and that shows that there was no brittleness. Normally brittleness, it goes like that and very quickly. It kept on going, it was, it went on like a copper metal, deforming it goes so much over. So, that was very interesting. So, even if you have a brittle polymer, if this, if the speed of loading or the thing is much less than brittle polymer, will not be brittle polymer. The same thing can, can be applied to materials like epoxy. So, always keep those things in mind. What has the, what has the extreme situations and how you can go from the extreme bad situations to extreme good situations. Because that is what as scientists and engineers and professionals and bosses in companies you have to guide and you have to do things. So, the rate of testing, the temperature of the test, that means again if you are going to lower temperatures, particularly if you go to below glass transition temperature, it will be brittle, but otherwise with polyethylene, even if you are testing at minus 20, minus 30, minus 40, it should be all right. The method of specimen preparation, how it is made and the size and shape of the samples and to only a small degree with polyethylene, the conditions of samples before testing. That means, whether the samples were subjected to any environmental stress cracking. Now, this is something which is important. We think polyethylene is so good. So, now, when Telephones were used. You have a question? No. When telephone, not the mobiles, but the landlines were used, they all used to the wires used to be underground, right? And low density polyethylene used to be the actually carrier of those copper cables. And then what people started seeing, because they thought low density polyethylene is so stable and so has so high electrical resistivity. And there they started finding that some of the those cables they stopped working. And then they went underground and they found those cables had cracked. And once they crack, water can diffuse through it, and then if you have the these electrical cords, they will naturally fuse, okay? They will just stop if positive and negative meets then they become yeah, shocking and okay. And that is how environmental stress cracking started. And my PhD work was actually on studying the mechanisms of environmental stress cracking under different conditions. So, that is when all on a sudden it made, I, I can never forget that polyethylene is so attractive, but polyethylene can undergo environmental stress cracking if you have a stress, a defect, because the defect can induce a crack and the crack can go under pressure. So, that is where fracture mechanics and other things. And if you can induce crazing, crazing is deformation, but without fracture, even then that can delay it. Okay? So, lots of this, these discoveries <coughs> and this, and then the companies who, who manufactured 
polyethylene, they found that their polyethylene business was not going going to be drained if they find out which grades of polyethylenes are are prone to such environmental stress cracking and that even soap water is all right or you know just very ordinary not ordinary pure ordinary whatever a little bit soap water and under very low pressure and then they found the certain grades of low density polyethylene and they are which they manufactured are prone to such things and then when i went to switzerland as a epf in lausanne you know lausanne where all this uh olympic games head, head office is there and then when i went there i found that their air conditioning things were having problem you know air conditioning how is it you have hot and cold water coming through the things and those hot and cold water the change of temperature they were cracking those plastic pipes and the same thing happened in my university of new south wales where the air conditioner things they put lot of water there and through the pipes and the water becomes hot and cold and they started cracking the pipes and then what i i was happy to i was not involved in the in the switzerland one in my university i told them that this is stress corrosion cracking so change the pipes when i went there i found they were also investigating that thing so whereas polyethylene is a very useful material like in air conditioning pipes and things like that but that can create one has to be selective about <coughs> polyethylene because if you have water floating so the, that is putting a stress onto the side of the pipes so that can have a tensile effect fracture or crack generation happens mostly under tensile component so there can be a tensile effect and if there are certain things kind of soap soap type things complication of things coming up or uh, it comes up from the models or wa- or the water or the things so those things can so if you have any any problem where you see that the, this air conditioner pipes are cracking so use this knowledge and you can you can solve it all right and then i was very happy and i i told my host they are a professor kaus kes i remember the third name and then then they said this is what it is then he said hang on i have read some journal papers with the name of some bandupada your same surname do you know that person i said no i don't know that <laughs> so i said you, you must be someone else so i didn't know but it all right but he was also very clever j j couch k u s c h a couple of days later he said hang on what is the name of your supervisor phd supervisor with whom you worked many years ago i said hr brown then he brought one of the papers he said there is a name is bound to pattern hr brown and you said you are not this one i said i have forgotten all about it <laughs> but i didn't want to do any more because as it is i was doing lots of new work and and at that time that institute switzerland is a very leading institute in the world there is they had atomic force microscopy now uns do not other university in australia are very leading but they didn't have any idea about it and then i worked on it an atomic force microscopy and i became so so impressed by that i sent a letter to my uh, colleague professor chris sorrell he is an american man so i knew that he would do it so i said please chris before i go back to uh, unsw please make sure you get some funds and get atomic force microscopy so that is another thing which and then professor anil phomik used to send his students to my university for three or four months when we had them atomic force microscopy that is another field do you have atomic force microscopy in your equipment in your department you have good atomic force microscopy can give you lot of information okay and i would like to see some of your papers in that area all right so this is how the 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 things the things happen and i have come to the final thing and just mentioning about the swiss academies there is a 
there is, in Zurich, there is a EM, EPMA, Swiss Academy for National Material Science, and it was a part of the University of Zurich, attached to the University of Zurich. So, once they developed a carbon nanotube with a coating, and they wanted to use it in applications. So, they sent their researcher to our place, and that generated a lot of information, and I also learned a lot of things about this new carbon tube, and it has a coating, which made it very highly controlling thing. So, EPFL and ETA Zurich are very leading universities in the world particularly in all. I think ETA Zurich has 15 Nobel, Nobel laureates in chemistry and 15 Nobel laureates in physics. So, when they developed that new thing and the director of EPMA he said, look, if you want this materials to be used in practical applications, send your student to this guy Bandy in University of New South Wales. I said, I know nothing about all this. He said, don't trust him. Send, send him to them. So, he came and I combined with another university, University of uh, Technology of Sydney. So, and he had to be there only for six weeks. So, within those six weeks, lots of work was done. And I told him, every day, even up to midnight or 1 a.m., 2 p.m., you send me your results by email. So, he sent my results and I sent him, asked him to do more and things. So, that was fantastic. Within four weeks, we generated some results and I had to get that. Eventually, that work was published in a journal called Advanced Materials, which has impact factor about 14 or 15. So, so keep these types of things. Lots of knowledge and you can do that. And your brain becomes so nice and accommodating. Like I'm learning so much things from all of you, okay? I would like to keep on doing that till the next couple of days. Okay, thank you. So, have a good holy. I had written a, a few lines, but I have not brought that piece of paper, so I will let you know that those lines later on. Okay? But, so far as we are concerned, we have almost completed the topic on polyethylene. And next, when we go back to this one, we will go to some of the other polymers. But, then polyethylene, low density is by, very useful. If you go to medium density, that is useful. If you go to high density, that becomes very strong, and that can be more impact favorable. Whereas low density polyethylene, you cannot work out an impact. If, even if you do this uh, sharpie or impact, this isos infracture, it will never fracture. It will keep on bending, but it will never fracture. So it is highly impact resistible. Okay? So thank you very much. Please have a good time. Thank you.